Hello everybody, my name is Anita and today we're going to be going over one of my favorite uh, parts of early childhood development, which is children's social emotional literacy. Before we begin the video, I want to let you know that you could pause the video at any moment to stretch your body, get something to drink or eat, or go to the bathroom. I also want to remind you to get a notebook and a pen or a pencil with you as we're going to be watching videos and taking notes from those videos. And now we're going to begin. In this video, we're going to try to define emotional literacy, explain how children expand their emotional vocabularies, describe how important it is to move from using simple emotional words like happy, sad, and mad, and introduce more complex words, how to use visual cues to help children learn new feeling words, define emotional regulation, and how to use emotional thermometer to help children regulate their own emotions. Now, before we start, we're going to start defining what emotional literacy is. But before we start, I want you to look at this video. What do you think this child is feeling right now? And how do you know what he's feeling? Is it the body language, the eyesight, how he's sitting? You're using some cues. Now, your knowledge of these cues is your emotional literacy. Now, children, unlike us, are still developing this emotional literacy and need some support from their caregivers and parents to help them grow their emotional literacy by having a robust emotional vocabulary. Now, we're going to watch a video that's going to help us define emotional literacy. While we're watching this video, I want you guys to think about what the definition of emotional literacy is, what way is the greatest way to increase children's emotional vocabulary and what are some things you can do when using direct teaching to increase children's emotional vocabulary see if i can play the video we're at the third level of our teaching pyramid which is social and emotional learning strategies so we're going to start with emotional literacy Children's emotional literacy is the foundation of social and emotional learning. It affects how children perceive social situations and it affects how they behave in an interpersonal problem solving setting. In fact, more than overall language ability for young children, their emotional vocabulary contributes uniquely to their ability to engage in a social emotional strategy and their behavior in a classroom and other settings. Emotional literacy is, could be defined as a child's ability to identify emotions in themselves and in others, and to express their emotions in a healthy manner, in a way that gets their needs met, that keeps everyone safe, and that is satisfying to them. Now, in order for this to happen, a child needs a robust emotional vocabulary. Think about it as that they need the name for an emotion in order to express it and in order to regulate it when they need to. So the first part of being able to identify feelings in themselves and in others is to increase a child's emotional vocabulary. And for this, I want to emphasize going beyond the usual suspects of happy, sad, and mad. And I say that because my colleague, Phil Strain, and I actually collected some data from about a thousand preschool children at one point, ages three, four, and five. We actually measured their emotional vocabularies. We showed them a lot of different pictures of different children with different expressions on their face. And we asked children to tell us as many different feeling words as they had for these different feeling faces. And what I can tell you is that even young three-year-olds at the beginning of their preschool year could identify happy, sad, and mad. And most of them could actually express that, um, happy, sad, and mad. And so we quickly want to move children in their preschool years beyond happy, sad, and mad into some more complex emotional words. Maybe frustrated, surprised, joyful, disappointed, feeling irritated, feeling amazed, feeling hopeful, feeling excluded, feeling like you belong, feeling loved, some words like that just to get you started. So one great way to increase young children's feeling vocabularies is by using direct teaching of feeling words. So you could do this just at small group time or at a whole group time where you bring in different 
feeling face pictures and you identify what the feeling is. So you give them that vocabulary word. Maybe you draw the children's attention to how the face is expressing that emotion. You ask the children to show you what it looks like on their faces. Maybe they turn to their neighbor and show each other what it looks like on their faces. And then you ask them about a time that they felt that way. Ask them to tell you a time that they felt that certain feeling. So I wanna show you a quick little video of a teacher who just does this so masterfully. She actually engages children in a direct teaching lesson about emotion words. So take a look. Did you look like that? Yeah. yeah. All right. What do you think this guy is feeling? Sad. Mm, look at him. Angry. Afraid. Afraid. Oh, look at him. Afraid. afraid. Scared or afraid? That's the same feeling. Afraid. How about this one? Sad. 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 Show me sad. Sad sort of makes you cry. You ever get so sad that tears come out? Yeah. yeah. What do you think this one is feeling? Happy. Now show me happy, because I know you guys are happy right now. So then that's going to be an easy one to show me. All right. Raise your hand if you'd like to take a risk and put your hand in this bag and pick a feeling. But I want you to put your hands on just for one minute and think about a time you felt like that when you get it. Be thinking if you can, if you pick happy of a time you were happy or if you pick sad. And you can tell us a time that you felt like that. What made you feel like that? Okay, who would like to take a risk? Okay, Joseph. What did you pick? Excited. Excited. How do you look when you're excited, first of all, Joseph? How do you look? Yes. yes. Now tell us a time when you felt like you wanted to say yes. Because I wanted to go to Chuck E. Cheese. And did you get to go? And you were excited? Mm -hmm. Were you excited while you were waiting to go? Yeah. Yeah, that made you excited. All right, I absolutely love how that teacher did that lesson. She did a few things that I'm sure you picked up on as well. So she named what the emotion was. She had the children express it. She asked a time that the children felt that way. And I absolutely love how she asked the children if they wanted to take a risk um, by talking about their emotions. So she's clearly establishing that this is a safe place in which you can talk about and express your emotions, which is really key to an emotionally literate classroom, if you will. And she did one other great thing there when she asked the little boy if he was excited and he was like, yes, and she's asked him to show how he was excited and we got that nice little yes that he gave us. And then she says, were you excited while you were waiting? And that's a lovely setup to talk about emotional regulation. So what do you do when you're just like so excited and you can't contain yourself? Like, how did you keep yourself calm? So she does just such a lovely job with direct teaching. Now, let me talk about a couple other things with direct teaching. So when we talk about direct teaching of emotional work, Words. We want to make sure that we're teaching emotional words in all of the children's languages that they speak. So we don't want to just um, teach it in one language, but if the children speak Spanish at home or they speak Mandarin, you want to also make sure that you're teaching the children the emotional vocabulary in their home language as well as in the language that maybe is the common language in the classroom. Another important thing is to make sure if children are nonverbal or children are deaf or hard of hearing is that they also learn the signs for expressing those emotions. So um, a teacher I worked with once had this really lovely way of showing these um, emotion words with also paired with the sign language. And she just went ahead and taught children not only the emotion vocabulary word, but also what the sign was to express that emotion, like happy, it was really great. So, um, so teaching children their emotional vocabularies, growing beyond happy be sad and mad, making sure that we're including all the languages that the children speak and including nonverbal um, uh, ways to express those emotions as well is all key to teaching direct teaching lessons of emotion words. So now we're going to talk about the video. And in that video, they gave us a definition of emotional literacy. And I hope you took some notes. So emotional uh, literacy is defined as a child's ability to identify to identify emotions in themselves and others and also to express those emotions in a healthy way. Children need those vocabularies taught to them because they don't have those vocabularies. They're going to need a lot of emotional vocabularies to be able to express and identify the emotions they feel.
And a great way to increase children's emotional vocabulary is direct teaching method where you're actually verbalizing and saying the emotion. And you can use a picture of the emotion and also asking the children to show you what they feel like. In the video, the teacher asked the boy, can you show me excited? And he did get up and he showed her yes. So she did ask the child to show her the emotion itself. And she had also had pictures of the emotions. She was asking them, what do you think this emotion is? And they said afraid and scared and they were saying happy. So she's using verbalization. She's using asking the children to show the emotions on their own body. And she's also using cards. What are some things you can do when using direct teaching methods to increase children's emotional vocabulary? One thing you could do is to use various uh, uh, emotional words and move away from just using those three simple words that we talked about, happy, sad, and mad. So use a more diverse set of emotional words. Another thing that you can do is make sure you're teaching emotional literacy in all the languages that are spoken inside your classroom. If the child is speaking Spanish or speaking Mandarin, so make sure you're using all different languages. Another thing you could do is, if you can, make sure you're adding sign language to define the emotion so children who are not nonverbal or hearing impaired could also understand. So you can have a cue card with a picture of a word silly, and you could word the word silly, and you could do the sign language for that word. Emotional literacy is the ability to identify, understand, and express emotions in a healthy way. And the benefits of emotional literacy for children is that they'll be able to manage frustration more successfully, have fewer conflicts, and engage in more positive behavior. Once they're able to identify what they're feeling, describe how they're feeling, and they're also able to recognize how other people are feeling, they're able to manage their own emotions, and they're able to make friends and understand how their friends and how their peers around them are feeling and be able to regulate that. So it means fewer conflicts, they're healthier, they can control their impulses better, have improved focus and achieve more in school. Now I'm gonna give you like a couple of seconds to think about what other benefits can you think about when it comes to children and teaching them emotional literacy. What do you think children can benefit from having a more uh, diverse set of emotional vocabulary and a robust emotional literacy? Think about that for a second. One thing I would think about is it would make them have more uh, more friendly because if you're able to regulate your emotion, understand your emotions and verbalize your emotions, other people can understand how you're feeling and can help you regulate with that too. So their social uh, being inside the classroom and the relationship with their peers and other adults around them can greatly be affected and could benefit from having children know emotional literacy. Now we're going to watch, when we talk about emotional literacy, we, there is a main factor that we need to consider and that is culture. Because in different cultures associate different expressions and different uh, emotions to so different things. So we need to be aware of the culture of the students that are in our classrooms and what that culture sees as the best emotions how that culture verbalizes emotions and how it associates different facial structures, body language to certain emotions. Now we're going to watch a video that talks about how culture is the main component of teaching emotional literacy. What we found was that uh, North American contexts, European American contexts, really value these excitement states, or what we call um, high arousal positive states, like excitement, enthusiasm, elation. Um, more than many East Asian contexts, which really value the more calm states, calm, peacefulness, serenity, what we call these low arousal positive states. Kids begin to develop an understanding of the emotions that they should feel or that they should display on their faces right around preschool age, between the ages of three and five. So we reason that it, once they developed this kind of understanding, that's when we should see cultural differences in ideal affect. Dr. Sai and her colleagues tested their theory. Which one do you think is more happy? They did a series of studies at Bing, 
That one? And a comparable Ooh, nursery school okay. in Taiwan, showing three groups of children, European American, Asian American, and Taiwanese Chinese, pictures uh -huh. of smiley faces. Thank you. We found that the European American kids were more likely to say that the excited smile was a smile that they wanted to be and that it was the smile that they thought was more happy compared to the Taiwanese Chinese kids and Asian American kids who are bicultural were right in the middle. And Dr. Sai's findings help being staff help children regulate their emotions with careful consideration to how one's culture might value a certain emotional state. Um, it certainly informs us and makes us more aware and, um, and that awareness really helps because you're not quick to judge and you can actually really talk as a team and really talk about that child's culture just because someone doesn't necessarily speak the language, because, um, they're, because a child is more reflective, more of an observer, then you, know, you really understand that, that perhaps it's not just that the child's shy, but the child might just be, that might be a cultural piece to that child and we really do value that. So like I said earlier, you need to be very mindful of the student's culture and where they come from and how that affects how they show emotion and how you understand their emotional expressions. So now we're going to move to conversations about feelings. Now we're gonna watch a video. And when we watch this video, I want you guys to think about what the teacher is doing in these situations regarding emotional literacy and what the children do. I'm going to give you a second to write down the questions in case you need to. And then we're going to go to the question, to the video. Would you like to play with the signs with Brian? Tell him, say, Brian, I want to play with you. Can we play together? Are you upset now? Well, Brian was sad and now Deshaun is upset. So how are we going to fix this? Tell me what, we, what can we do? So do you have a suggestion of what we can do? What can we do so Deshaun won't be upset and Bryant won't be sad? We can share. We can share. You think we could share? Would you like to share with Bryant? Bryant, can you tell him so we can share? We can share. I don't, you think Deshaun is ready to share? No. I don't think he's ready. So we'll let Deshaun, Deshaun needs a little bit of time to feel better. Okay, Deshaun? All right. Oh, that is a great video. So let's get back to the questions. What does the teacher do in this situation with regard to emotional literacy? One of the main things the children, the teacher does is she asks them questions. She asks them, how do you think Sean is feeling? How do you think Brian is feeling? And once she recognizes the emotions that Sean is upset and Brian is sad, she asks the students, what can we do? What can we do? Those two are, one is upset and one is sad. She asks the students, what can we do? And the girl, she replies, share. And she said, yes, you can share. And she asked Brian to ask Deshaun if uh, he wanted to share. And Deshaun didn't want it to share, but she's asking them questions and she's leading them and she's parallel talking. She's leading them to regulate the children's emotion and understand how those two are feeling. So to help them understand, she's asking them questions. What do the children do? So the children, the children did respond to her question when she was asking them, how do you feel and how do you think they felt? The girl replied and even with the solution and when she was asking them, what do you think we can do to solve this? The girl said, share. So the children are listening to the teacher and they're responding to her questions. Now feeling discussions. We're gonna watch another video and in this video, I want you to think about how the teacher directly teaches emotional vocabulary. And based on what you observed, how will you use this direct teaching method with the children that you are going to be working with? Let's go. Feeling discussion. He's feeling nervous about riding in a boat. What can we say to him? It's okay, Turtle. It's okay, Turtle. What else can we say to him? I like how Kaylee's holding him. Kaylee's holding him. How does that make him feel, Kaylee? Oh, you need a tissue. Is this? Oh, she does. You really noticed her nose. Is this how my turtle's feeling, Robbie? Yeah. How is that feeling? I call that nervous. He's a little bit nervous. 
Is he sad? Oh, look at this one. He's scared. He's scared. You know that face, don't you? He is scared. Icky. Icky? How about this one? How is he feeling there? Happy. Happy. You really know those pictures, don't you? That is fun, too. So the teacher is using direct teaching uh, to teach the children emotional vocabulary words, and she is using pictures, as you saw in her hand. She had those uh, stick figure looking drawings with different emotions on them. And she's asking the, the, the students, how do you think the turtle felt? And they're pointing at the different picture and saying the words is sad and nervous. So she's using pictures and she's also verbalizing the uh, words to teach them those emotional vocabulary. Based on what you observe, how we use direct teaching methods. So think about that. Based on what you saw and in her interaction with the children and asking them questions, how will you teach children grow their emotional vocabulary? So you could ask them questions, acknowledge the children's response, like she said when they were saying sad, and she said, well, you think he's feeling sad? So she acknowledges their response so that they're listening. And she also changed the cues to move the activity along to the next one once they knew that one. So that's, those are ways that you could use to grow. But think about other ways that you could use while you work with children. Now we're going to go to emotional vocabulary. We're going to watch a video. Uh, and in this video, I want you to think about what research says about children who express high rate of challenging behavior and their amount of emotional words that they know and what the name of the teaching method of emotion words being labeled throughout the day is. So I want you to think about these two questions as we watch this video. I have a little challenge for you. So I want you to, and I'm gonna give you exactly one minute to do this. I'd like for you to take out a scratch piece of paper or on your notepad, and I wanna challenge you to come up with, beyond happy, sad, and mad, 10 other feeling words that you could teach young preschoolers. So ready, set, go. Did you get 10? Sometimes people struggle a little bit, and I want to tell you that if you were struggling to come up with 10, you're not alone. Um, but rest assured, there are over 500 emotion descriptive words in the English vocabulary. It's just sometimes we don't use them very often, so we can struggle to come up with that 10. But let's say you came up with 10, or however many you came up with, why did I have you do that? Well, remember I told you that emotional vocabulary is really a foundational part of children's social emotional learning, that it's connected to how they'll perceive a social situation, and it also influences how they will behave in an interpersonal problem solving situation. And so what I wanted to tell you, you know, I told you we collected data on quite a few preschool children and we looked at their emotional vocabulary. Well, in another study, we did that same thing where we looked at the emotional vocabulary of young children, but we knew something else about these young children. We knew if these children were currently exposed expressing or experiencing high rates of challenging behavior that was concerning to teachers and parents in the classroom setting 
and those that weren't. So we kind of put the children into two groups, those with challenging behavior and those who are not expressing challenging behavior. And we looked at the and compared their emotional vocabularies. And what we found is that the children that had high rates of challenging behavior had far fewer emotional vocabulary words in their vocabulary. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. You're thinking, well, yeah, that's because there's this relationship between children's language development and their challenging behavior. And that's absolutely true. You are right. There is a connection. So if I don't have, um, if my uh, kind of verbal expression is not uh, developing, typically I might engage in challenging behavior. But we were able to control for this overall language, and we still saw that there was something unique contributing to that um, increase in challenging behavior that had to do with their decreased or their depressed emotional vocabulary. So for that reason alone, we know it's important to really build young children's emotional vocabulary. So if you struggle to come up with 10, make sure that you um, do some uh, research and come up with a lot more feeling words that you could use to teach young children. Now I want you to do another little quiz here. I want you to look at that list of emotion words that you came up with, and I want you to just put a plus next to it if it is an emotion that you personally um, enjoy experiencing, okay? So if it's a, a pleasant emotion for you, I want you to put a plus next to it. If it's an emotion that you do not actually like to um, experience, then put a negative next to it, okay? A minus next to it. And I just want you to glance at that list of feeling words and the pluses and minuses and kind of come up with a sense of your ratio, if you are more to the positive or if you are more to the negative. All right, if you are like most people that take this little quiz, um, your words might be skewed a little bit towards the negative. Maybe you had words like disappointed and frustrated and irritated and bored, et cetera, in that list. Maybe you had a lot more positive words, and for that I wanna congratulate you for being such a positive person. But if you had that word skewed, that word list skewed a little bit to the negative, you are not alone. That's usually what people do. Now, why am I asking you to do that? Well, remember, I told you that those young children had that we had in two groups, those with challenging behavior and those without, that the ones with challenging behavior had far fewer emotion words. But the other thing that we knew about their emotion words is that they were almost exclusively negative feeling words. In fact, some of the children would look at expressions of happiness or joy on somebody's face, and they would actually label it as, feel, as mad, as, as bad even. And so they had far fewer emotion words, and the words that they had were almost exclusively negative feeling words. Now, this gets into another way to teach emotion words, which is this incidental teaching of emotion words. And it's probably the most powerful way in which we learn um, emotion words. And that is when they just are labeled for us as we're going through our day. So if you think about it, the way that young children learn any vocabulary word is that somebody labels it for them in their setting. So they're sitting at snack time and they have a cup and somebody labels it as a cup or somebody calls it a bottle when they're younger. And um, that's how they start to learn the emotion word. Somebody's labeling that thing or that object um, as they are experiencing or interacting with it. Well, it's the same thing with emotional vocabulary words. So usually the child is, you know, throughout the day experiencing different emotions or expressing different emotions and somebody perhaps labels that for them. That's called an incidental teaching, um, is that I label it kind of in the moment or, or as it's happening. Now, this is the most powerful way that children learn emotional vocabulary words, and unfortunately, it's one of the ways that we learn a lot of negative feeling words. It's one of the ways that those children with challenged behavior um, grew an almost exclusively negative um, emotion list. And I want you to also consider how powerful emotion words are when somebody labels it for you in the middle of the day. So I'm going to tell a story that um, that occurs to me, you know, far more often than I wish that it would. But maybe this has happened to you. So you're going through your day, you're feeling fine, you don't have any like kind of you know big emotions that you're experiencing. Perhaps you're just feeling fine, and somebody comes up to you and they say, "Are you okay? You look tired. You look stressed." And immediately it can kind of affect you. Like, well, I wasn't. Well, yeah, maybe I am feeling tired. Maybe I'm feeling kind of stressed. Um, so it can really affect you. And we actually know from some research by folks like John Gottman and others that there is this like way that our brains and our central nervous system reacts differently when you hear an emotional vocabulary word. 
Let's go back to these children that I'm really concerned about, these children that have high rates of challenging behavior, that have almost exclusively negative feeling words in their emotion list. And let's think about how they might be experiencing their day in their preschool classrooms. So indeed, when we watch these children in their preschool classrooms, we see that when their teachers do use emotion words, which is not as often as you would if you might expect or think, that when the teachers do use emotional vocabulary words with these young children in an incidental fashion, meaning that they're labeling them for them as they're experiencing them during the day, they use almost exclusively negative feeling words. So the child shows up at school and they might hear things like, I know you're mad. I know that that irritates you. I know you're frustrated. I know you're disappointed. Now, I totally understand what these teachers are trying to do and I've been there myself. You're trying to like, you're thinking, if I can give this angry child 500 different ways to express being angry, then they're less likely to hit. And that's, that's true, right? So you do need your words in order to use them um, instead of hitting. But the other thing is to remember how those emotion words affect you, right? So imagine those children that are already struggling, already struggling to kind of engage in appropriate behavior, already struggling to engage in positive social emotional experiences. Um, they're, they're struggling already and all they're hearing are kind of these negative feeling words. Remembering that Emotional vocabulary can affect how you perceive situations, how you solve um, interpersonal problem solving situations. So this is a pretty big thing for us to be considering is how many negative emotions we're layering on for this child. Let's imagine instead that child shows up at school and they're greeted with the teacher saying, oh my goodness, when grandma gave you that hug goodbye, you looked so loved. Oh my gosh, when I told you what we were having for breakfast, you looked so excited and happy. You love those waffles, don't you? And when you were sharing things at Show and Share, you looked so generous. Oh my gosh, I saw you go down the slide in that new way. You looked so proud when you got down. When I told you what book we were reading, you looked absolutely enthusiastic. So you can imagine how different their day might go. So not only do you wanna build a child's emotional vocabulary, you also wanna be very uh, mindful of how you're using vocabulary words throughout the day, noting that that's one of the most powerful ways you can build a young child's emotional vocabulary and thinking about dwelling a little bit on the positive in those situations. So now we're gonna go back to the questions. What does research show about children who express high rate of challenging behavior with regard to the amount of emotional words that they know? And according to the video, like you heard in the video, what we know from research is that children who show challenging behavior do have a limited amount of uh, emotional words in their vocabulary. And according to research, most of the words that they know are actually negative emotional words and not positive. And the second question is, what is the name of the teaching method of emotional words being labeled throughout the day? And that is called incidental teaching, where you are teaching children emotionally words and vocabulary throughout the day and not at a specific lesson time. Since, since they're there in the morning till the end of the day, you're using different incidents and in what's happening throughout them to teach them those emotional uh, words. Now in the video, she, uh, we, you presented an activity where you listed a 10 words. And like she said, most people are not able to list 10 feelings in the amount of time that everybody was given. And even when they were uh, listing down, most people do tend to write negative words. So like she said, don't feel bad if you wrote negative words. Most people do tend to write negative words. So because of that, we want you to share many emotional words. We want you to advance and broaden the children, the amount of vocabulary, the amount of emotional words that the children have. So do use the words happy, mad, sad, and angry that are common, but add more complex emotional words like surprised, enthusiastic, annoyed, disappointed, disheartened, excited, proud. Just like when you teach literacy, the richer the vocabulary, the more rewarding the experience. So for children, the richer the emotional word, the more 
the more diverse set of emotional words you give them, the more they're able to express how they feel and understand how they feel, especially for children with challenging behavior who already have a limited amount of vocabulary. And from that limited, most of it is negative. So make sure to add more positive emotional words into their vocabulary. Like I said earlier, there are negative and positive words. Most people do tend to recognize more negative words, especially for children with challenging behavior. So do be mindful to add more positive emotional words into the children's vocabulary, like bold and brave and lucky and optimistic and amazed, thankful, warm. So there are a lot of vocabulary words that you can add into the children's uh, emotional literacy. Yes, like I said, include positive emotional words. In one study, children who had fewer emotional words in their vocabulary also showed ongoing challenging behavior. So to counter that, for children who are showing challenging behavior, do be mindful of how much positive emotional words that you are adding and be mindful of how you're using incident, incidental teaching throughout the day and how much positive emotional words you're adding throughout the day to grow their vocabulary, their emotional vocabulary. And you can also use photos. You could plan ahead and use photos. So when you see the child in a different emotional state, take a picture and label that emotion that they're feeling. So you could show them a picture of themselves with that emotion. Like for this child, there's discouraged and joyful. So you can see pictures of that child in that emotional state and define that state and use that photo and that artifact that you made to help them understand how, what they're feeling and grow their emotional uh, vocabulary. Now, for science of emotion, we're gonna watch another video. And while we watch this video, I want you guys to think about how the teacher teaches the emotional vocabulary, how the children respond, and what else do you think the teacher could have done more? Does anybody know what this one is? Silly, remember, I'm the silly teacher. All right. Then we have, which one is this one? This means excited. I'm not just happy, I'm excited. Oh, this one's a good one. Angry. Yes, I'm mad. All right. All right, so we have angry. Angry, we have happy. We have excited. We have silly. I'm so silly. That was a very silly video. So what does the teacher teach? How does the teacher teach emotional vocabulary? In that video we saw, how do you think she thought? So she used sign language. She not only said the words, the emotional words, but she also signed. She said mad or angry. And she showed them happy, excited, and silly. So she used sign language to grow their emotional vocabulary. And the children responded by mimicking her movements. So when she was doing silly, the children were trying to do silly. When she does mad, they were trying to copy mad. And she also used her face expression to uh, connect with the words. What else could the teacher do? So she could have asked them, when she was teaching the specific uh, words, she could have asked them a time where they felt those specific emotions to help them connect it to their own experiences. So she could ask them after she said, let's say excited, tell me about a time where you felt excited. So they could connect the feeling that they felt in that moment and the feeling to the word and the emotion and the sign language that she was teaching them. Able throughout the day. Like we talked earlier, it's best to use incidental teaching when it comes to uh, growing children's emotional vocabulary. Describe what you notice about children's mood throughout the day. Like for example, in this photo, you could say, you two seem really happy to be playing together. You keep hugging each other. So you're using just regular incidents that happen inside the classroom, regular activities and stuff to describe the emotions that the children are feeling and showing to grow their vocabulary. So incidental teaching, label the emotion throughout the day. Now we're gonna watch another video. And in this video, I want you guys to think about how the teacher enables the child's emotion and how the child responds. Can we 
do a drum roll, please? Excited. So are we ready? Are we ready to have Brittany place the necklace over Sierra? Drum roll, please. Da -da 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 -da. Sierra! Hey, you. how does this teacher label the, ch the child's emotion? The teacher does this by asking the child how she felt. She asked her, are you excited? And the, the student nodded, the, the child responded by nodding her head. And also the teacher said, I can see the big smile on your face. So I know that you're excited. So the teacher is also showing that the big smile on her face shows her emotions. So she's using asking questions and also reading the child's uh, facial expressions. And the child is responding by body language. Now we're going to watch another video. In this case, I want you guys to think about how the teacher notices the boy's feelings, what she does, and what else she could have done. Logan is going to feel this way because look what he figured out. He's pumping himself on the swing. Look at him go. He's going to be happy and proud. Do you remember what proud means? Yeah. What does it mean? It means you feel happy inside about something you've done. You Like, I'm proud. Oh, watch out, Ella. Like, Logan's going to be proud that he figured out how to pump himself on the swing. In that video, how does the teacher notice the boy's feeling? She does that by showing him the, his po the positive emotion. She's looking at him and she shows them the positive emotion that he's feeling. She has this big cards that she have with different emotions, picture of different emotions with the words on them. And she goes through happy and proud. And she shows him the same proud. And she also, does the teacher, do she also shows the other children what he's feeling, he's feeling proud. And she shows them the picture so that the children are also able to recognize what the child is feeling. And what else could the teacher do is ask the child, do you feel proud? So let them recognize their own emotions. Do you feel proud? And ask them why they feel proud. So it could grow their learning. Now we're gonna move to identifying emotions. Identifying emotions help children, and we're going to talk about helping children read cues, point out expression on faces, body language, and tone of voice. For example, in the first picture we saw, I asked you, how did you know what that child was feeling? And you know that because you were reading the expression on his face, his body language, even though you can't hear his tone of voice. So these three things we know because we have emotional literacy. But for children, we have to develop these skills for them. So they're able to recognize other people's emotions and identify them. So we're going to watch a video. And while we watch this video, I want you guys to think about how the teacher helps the child identify her emotions, how the teacher helps other children notice the emotion that the child is feeling, and how the child responds. When I look through my binoculars, I see Kaylee's happy face. Sophia, you can go ahead. She can go. You can go sit down with a bunch of swine. Okay. Look at this. I'm going to look around. I'm going to see Robbie's smiling face. Robbie, I see your smiling face with my mouth. I see Rose's smiling face. Today, today we have a jungle in dramatic play. And we are going to use, Megan, we are going to use these binoculars to look for insects. And you're gonna know it's an insect because it has how many legs? Six. Okay, so I'm gonna use my binoculars now to see how people are feeling. Okay, I'm gonna look over here. Sophia, I see you. Hey Chase, I can see Sophia through here. Sophia, how are you feeling today? She's not happy. How can we tell she's a little bit sad? I heard it in her voice. Did you hear that? 
Her face looks a little bit sad. Do you want to tell us why you're feeling sad, Sophia? Because my mom's not here. Mom's happy. Her mom's not here. She's not happy. Maybe she's missing her mom. That was a great example. So how does this teacher help the child identify her emotion? The teacher helps the child identify her emotion by asking her. So she goes around looking through and she says, Ruby, I see you feel sad. I see you feel happy because they're sitting. And then she goes to her and she says, Sophia, I see you through my binoculars. How do you feel? How does the teacher help the other children to notice emotions? So she asks the other children, how do you think she feels? And the child says, I don't feel good, I feel sad. And she does the body motion. And then the children respond by saying uh, she feels sad because they're looking at her face. They say look at her face because they're looking at her face. And the teacher says, I could hear it in her tone. The teacher is telling them that they could hear it in her tone, but the children responded by saying her face. They recognized that Sophia was feeling sad by looking at her face, but the teacher directed them to help them look at Sophia's face and understand how Sophia was feeling in that moment. Now we're gonna watch another video. In this video, again, I want you to think about what does the teacher say and do to help the children identify their feelings and how the children respond. You saw a big storm. How did it make you feel, Jason, when you saw that big storm? How did it make you feel? Come and show me how it make you feel. <coughs> were you scared? You were scared? Yeah, I was three years old. When you were three years old, you were scared. That's and how did that teacher. feeling go away? What did you do? Teacher, when I was uh, run Just away. You run, run away? away? And where did you run away to? To my house. Ah, and who was inside the house waiting for you? Um, my big brother. So he, you're... His name Henry. So Henry helped you? Yeah. And after Henry helped you, how did it make you feel? Happy. Happy. So that's one way that we can be, feel better. We can go ask for help from somebody else. Did he give you a hug? He did. So do hugs make us feel better? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Jason. What would you like to share with us? Mm -hmm. I was scared because the, the storm was getting closer. And you were feeling like this too? And what did you do to help you feel better? My mom. Oh, your mommy helped you. How did she help you? She hugged you. Ah, oh, how nice of that. Thank you for sharing that with us. Anybody else would like to share their, their story? Leslie, come on over. Oh, Brian too? Okay, you'll be next, Mr. Brian. So what does the teacher say to help children identify their feelings? What the teacher says is she asks them questions. She asks them, what do you feel? How do you feel? And she kept asking them questions as the boy came out and he said he felt scared. She asked him why and what he did next. And he said he went to his home and he got with his brother and he got a hug from his brother. So the teacher was not just only able to ask them questions to get them to identify their feelings, but she also asked enough questions to get them to answer how they got out of those feelings of being, feeling scared. So the boy got a hug from his brother and the girl got a hug from her mom to help them deal with that emotion of scared that they pointed to. And also the teacher had pictures on the wall that the child walked up to and pointed. So she asked the child to come up and point to the emotion they felt. And while he was trying to figure out and he was pointing, she said the word that he was pointing to. So she's asking questions. She's verbalizing the pictures that they pointed to. And she's also connecting the emotions they felt to how they regulated it, regulated it at that moment getting hugs and she's also broadcasting that to all the children telling them do we feel good when we get hugs and the children responded to her yes so she's also teaching them the regulation methods how does the teacher do to help the children identify their feelings what is the those are the same
Those are the ways that she helped them identify their feelings. She used the stickers, she brought them up to the stage, and she verbalized their emotions. Now, learning how to identify the emotions in other people is a huge, is a very, very good school, is a very, very good skill, especially for children who are creating bonds and relationships with other people. It's very fundamental to understand how other people are feeling to create that bond with other people. And that is empathy. Empathy is an identification with an understanding of others' feelings and emotions. So when we want to teach children empathy, we want them to be able to identify and understand other people's feelings and emotions. So teach empathy. And one way you could teach empathy is to model empathy. So when a child is feeling sad, model how to ask that child. Model saying, how do you feel or you feel sad? Is there anything I can do to help you or how to help them calm down? Because the children are always going to be watching you and listening to what you're saying. So you could grow their emotional vocabulary and you could teach them empathy by modeling. Offer a like and different activities. So you could offer different activities. Point out cues that show how others are feeling. So if a child is sitting down crisscross like this, and you could say, oh my God, look at Johnny, his arms are crisscrossed, how his eyes are supposed together, and his face is red. What do you think he feels? So you're helping them recognize the body language and the facial expressions, which are cues that they can use to understand how he is feeling. So you're helping them recognize the cues. Encourage role playing and role reverse. So you could have one, two children, and one be the angry one, and one try to calm and recognize how the other one is angry and reverse that. So they're able to see how people express emotions with body language, facial expressions, and tones. And you could teach empathy by reinforcing empathy. So when you see a child identifying and recognizing another child, make sure you. Uh, reinforce that and acknowledge that. So if a, sad, a child is sitting down and he's sad, another child comes and gives him water or napkin, you should be like, oh my God, you figured out he was sad and you brought him a napkin or water to make him feel better. You were being empathetic. They're showing that they can understand and relate to that child's emotions. So make sure you reinforce their behavior. Now we're gonna go to tools for teaching emotional literacy. Tools you might need. A routine to identify feelings. Teachers and children can check in daily by choosing feeling faces to describe their moods. Children can change their feeling faces during the day as their emotions shift. So if you have all the pictures of your children, including yourself on a wall, then you can have different emotional stickers. And at the beginning of the day, you can ask them, how are you feeling? And they could take whatever sticker feeling that they're feeling and they could put it next to their name. So they're learning how to associate themselves with that emotion. And when they do that, you could tell them, oh, you're feeling happy today. Why? Oh, you're feeling sad today. What happened? And you're also putting yourself in there so you're able to model it. To keep asking them why they feel that way. And in that way, they could also change the emotion throughout the day, depending on what they're feeling. So we're going to watch another video, and while we watch this video, I want you guys to think about how the teacher encouraged children to identify their emotions and how the girl in the video responds. Tell us how you feel today. Too many weather persons. Oh, I know. We might have to sing the weather song together. She was feeling mad, she told me, at her brother, but now I think she's thinking about changing her mind. She's feeling a little different. Oh, what is that one, friend? Love. love. Let's hear why she feels loved. Well, tell us. Because um, I, because, um, I, because I love Frankie and Riley. You love your friends Frankie and Riley. She is so cute. So how the teacher encouraged the child to identify their emotion, the teacher asked, how are you feeling today? And she also had a, a, a wall with a sheet of emotions and the child used the clip to go and put it on the loved one because that's how she was feeling. So the teacher asked how the child is feeling and she also had the sheet 
in the pictures so the children identify what they think so they can pinpoint. So when the child put in, put it on left, she put that she was feeling love. And the teacher moved even more and asked her, why are you feeling loved? And the child said, because she loves her friends, Riley, and I forgot the other name. So the teacher is not only helping the child recognize how she's feeling, but why she's feeling that way. And the girl in the video responds by uh, pinning her little clip at the loved emotion, but also responding to the question why she feels that way. So she actually describes why she feels that way. Characteristics of classrooms that foster emotional literacy. So one of the good things that you could put inside a classroom that, that shows you have a classroom that is attuned to teaching children emotional vocabularies is having books in the reading area. So most classrooms, preschool classrooms, have reading areas on one corner or story centers or reading centers. So make sure in those centers have books about feelings that are read constantly and are available for them to read. Photos of people with various emotions displayed across classrooms. And it would even be better if it's photos of the children themselves and has labels on it. So whenever they look at it, you can like tell them, oh, that is you when you were sad, when you were happy. That's better. Teachers label their own feelings. So if you walk, walk into the classroom in the morning or you're there and they come in and you say, oh, God, I feel so excited to be here today. It was a sunny day in the morning. I had a great breakfast. Or when they come in the morning and give you a hug, you say, oh, I feel loved. You are giving me a hug, so I feel loved. So make sure you label your own emotions a model. Teachers notice and label other children's emotions. You also notice and label their emotions. Oh, I see you're feeling exhausted today. I see you're feeling tired. Why are you feeling tired? Do you need a little nap? Oh, I see you're not eating your lunch today. How are you feeling? What are you feeling? Oh, I see you're a little bit sad. Oh, I see your face and your body. You're running around. You feel happy. So you label their emotions for them. Plan activities that teach and reinforce emotional literacy. And also make sure you reinforce the children who are using emotional words. And this all should happen throughout the day regularly like commonly like we talked about incidental teaching it should happen throughout the day this is a great way so in this classroom you can see pictures of different emotions so with how do you feel today where your children can point and you could read the word for them and they can see and there's a mirror next to it and what makes that cool is that the children can stand there and you could even pinpoint as sad and ask them, can you show me your sad face? And then when they're doing that, so they can look at themselves in that emotional state, what their uh, facial expression and body language looks like in those different emotional states. So you can go through, those are like 16 emotions here that are expressed. So you could have one child or two child there and ask them one by one to go through those 16 emotions and to help them see what their body looks like and their face looks like while they're feeling those emotions. You could portray, you could have a role play activity. And that's a great way so they could see what they look like and they could put point to the emotion. And another thing you could do is have this board where you take pictures of children throughout the day and ask them how they're feeling in that moment and write it down. And then you could use that as a way to teach a specific emotion. Like for example, in that one says, Devin says making a house with blocks makes him feel happy. So that could be like a memory for him. You have a picture of that child while he was doing that activity. He was probably building a block and you go ask them, oh my God, how do you feel? And they're like, they're happy because I'm building a block. So you have that memory with feeling. Posters, children can describe what makes them feel a certain emotion. Teacher can help children write down their story. So you annotate what they say. And you could look back at this. You could save all of these memories and you could look back at it and like create a little book, book of emotions for that child. Or you can use a feeling wheel where the children can tell you, they can move the wheel and tell you what they're feeling throughout the day. So when they're pinpointing that out, make sure you verbalize the word and you feel like, oh, you feel embarrassed? Why do you feel embarrassed? You feel nervous? Why do you feel nervous? Is there anything we could do to make you feel not nervous? Or what you could do to be not nervous? So you could use the feeling wheel to help them identify their emotions, or you could even use that to help them identify other people's emotions, ask them, how do you think he feels? And they could pinpoint. 
you could play games with how do you feel discuss typical situation ask them how would you feel if this happened to you this is really good especially if you when you're reading a book but you can ask them like how political situations like if you stepped on your feet how would you feel or you can use examples marcus and like in this example says marcus wanted to play with alex but alex wouldn't let him how do you think marcus felt how do you think you would feel and what would marcus do so asking these questions especially the last question what would marcus do and what would you do would not only help them to identify what they're feeling and what they would feel if they were in that situation but it would also help them to move a next step further and say what they need to do with that emotion what they can do to manage that emotion to regulate it use children's storybooks children's storybooks are amazing tools to use to teach children and grow their emotional vocabulary because most characters in children's books do have very uh, big official expressions and body language so if they're writing an angry character they usually are like this so you could use children's books to grow not just grow their emotional vocabulary but help them identify you could ask them look at his face look at his body how do you think this character is feel why do you think he's feeling that way so you're helping them identify what other people are feeling these are some books that you could use that are great when it comes to helping children recognize uh, other people's emotions. You can pause it and write them down if you want to. Uh, using books to identify emotions. Now we're going to watch a video and while we watch this video, I want you to think about how the teacher uses a book to talk about feelings and how she extends the boys vocabulary, emotional vocabulary. I don't know. Do you think he's going? It looks like he's heading right there, doesn't it? Yeah, as he jumps over the moon, what happens? He, he looks like he's going to run right into the house. How do you think he's going to feel if he runs into the house? Sad. You know what? What else could he feel? Look at my face. How do you think I feel? Or mad or how about have you ever heard the word furious furious means really really angry do you ever get really really angry no yeah sometimes you do sometimes i do too not very often though usually i just get mad so the cow could be sad mad he could even be furious yeah because he's going to run into that house and he's going to get what hurt no, this house is little. No, the house is little, but the cow is what? Big. Big. All right, how about these guys over here? Can you tell how they're feeling? Good. Yeah, they kind of look good. They might be happy, or they might just be tired. Or happy. Yeah? Happy. And there were two little kittens and a pair of mittens. That boy is really cute. So how does the teacher use a book to talk about feelings? One way she does is she asks the child how the character feels. She asks him, how do you think he feels? And the boy responds, sad. And, she, and then she tries to correct it by asking him, look at my face. How do you think this feels? And she gives him this angry face and he looks at her face and he says sad. And then he said mad. And then he says mad. How does she extend the boy's emotional vocabulary? So when he says mad, she she asks them have you ever heard of the word furious so she grows and extends his emotional vocabulary by introducing a new word furious and she asks him have you ever heard the word furious and he said no and then she said when you get really really angry that is what means furious and she asked him have you ever felt that way and he said no but the girl next to her said yes so that means the girl's emotional vocabulary also just grew they both got introduced to a new word now we're going to move to emotional regulation ability to regulate emotion contributes to children's ability to behave positively and express long-term social success so that is true. So if children are able to regulate and calm down their own emotions, it will help them with uh, participating in activities, having long term uh, plays with children and building stronger relationships with their friends. So now we're going to watch a video about emotional 
regulation. While we watch this video, I want you guys to think about what the definition of emotional regulation is, what is one way to help children learn how to regulate their emotions, and what is one way to teach children how to get back to the calm level of the emotional thermometer. All right, now I want to talk about emotional regulation. So we're building children's emotional vocabularies. We'll talk about a few ways to help children control anger and impulse, but I want to talk about this idea of kind of regulating strong emotions or what to do when children are experiencing these big uncomfortable feelings and how to bring those back down into more of a comfortable feeling zone, if you will. So one of the ways we do that is by introducing some feeling words that maybe we don't think about introducing to young children. Take a look at that list you wrote um, a, a little while ago of 10 words and see if maybe these words were on your list. Um, so one of the feeling words we introduce is this idea of feeling tense. And even when I say that, I start to feel tense. Again, emotion words can affect you. So feeling tense, or you might use the word stressed because children might hear that word being used with adults around them. So feeling tense or feeling stressed. And the idea is that feeling tense um, you might start to feel this tension in your body. Maybe you feel tension in your body when you're mad. Maybe you feel it when you're disappointed. Maybe you feel it when you're um, jealous. So there might be different feelings that, ex that create this kind of tension or stress in your body. And so when you're feeling that, your shoulders maybe are feeling tense and stressed, kind of moving up. Maybe your jaw gets tense. Maybe your brows furrow a little bit. Maybe you make your... Um, fists, uh, you know, your hands into fists. So feeling tense or feeling stressed. And so we introduce that term to young children. They get it. They do feel tension and stress in their bodies. They can tell you times that they feel that way, things that make them feel that way. They can tell you how it feels on their body. Sometimes we have them walk around like Tin Man, feeling very tense, feeling very stressed. Um, we bring in raw spaghetti noodles that are so tense and they might break, right? So this feeling of tension. And then we introduce this other feeling, which is feeling, feeling calm, feeling relaxed. Um, you know, we bring in that instead of raw spaghetti, cooked spaghetti, right? Feeling relaxed. So we just shake out all of our muscles. We feel very calm and content. We talk about what that feels like. We talk, we do maybe some gentle stretches. We play some calm music. We identify times during the day that we can introduce calmness. Maybe it's during lunchtime that we turn the lights down a little bit and play some soft, soothing music. Maybe we lower our voices during lunchtime so it's calm. Maybe it's right before nap time when you're um, rubbing their back and you talk about how they feel so, oh, you look so content, so relaxed, right? And so we talk about how do we get from feeling this very uncomfortable, tense, you know, this stress in our bodies to feeling calm and feeling relaxed. Oh boy, that's where I want to spend my day is feeling relaxed. And so one of the ways that we can help young children do that is with this idea of the emotional um, uh, thermometer, the anger thermometer, sometimes what we call it, but you can think about it as an emotional um, thermometer. And the idea is that up at the red area is that feeling that makes you feel tense and stressed, right? So maybe for some children, it's anger. Maybe for some children, it's disappointment or jealousy. So whatever it is that makes you feel that tension, makes you feel that stress, um, is that red um, area emotion. And then down at the very bottom is quite the opposite. And that's where we feel calm and content, relaxed, right? That's in the blue area. And there's, of course, all different kind of feelings in between, all different colors that you can see on that emotional um, thermometer right there from feeling blue, green, yellow, or you can imagine that there's all these different colors in between. And that's what we want children to understand is that there's all these different feelings that they experience, perhaps between feeling relaxed and feeling that kind of tension, right? Because the key here is to identify when you're getting close to that red area so that you can get back down into that blue, right? So to recognize like what happens right before you were so tense and stressed that you hit somebody, that feeling right before is that should be that kind of signal to you to get back down into that blue area. Now, how do you get back down into that blue area? Well, one of the most tried and true ways for both adults and children is to take deep breaths, to do some mindful breathing. So we talk about taking three deep breaths. Now three is not the magic number by any means, but it's just this idea that we want children to concentrate on their breath. 
Now, if you tell a young child to take three deep breaths when they're upset and agitated, most likely they're going to hyperventilate and take very, very short, quick, deep breaths that are not going to help. So what we want to do is help them to slow their breaths and to attend, to be mindful of that breathing. So one of the ways we do that is with this idea of smelling the flower, taking that breath in through their nose and blowing out the candle, blowing it out through their mouth. And so as we do this, we want to give them some narration, like feeling the air moving in through their nose. Can they feel it filling up their lungs? Can they take a breath so deep it goes to their toes? And then breathing out, breathing out that candle. Maybe they have candles on their toes and they're breathing it out that far down. So it's that idea that they're going to start getting mindful of the breath that takes them out of their worry, their anger, their madness, their scared, whatever it's making them feel in that tense and stressed way. We want them to take a break from that and instead just be mindful of that breathing until their bodies are feeling calm and relaxed. Children can make emotional thermometers. You can see a picture right here of this, um, this little girl is making an emotional thermometer where she has different feeling faces. She can color them in different ways, paste them on there. She can tell a story about a time that she got, whoa, way up into the red and then back down into the blue. How did she do that? So you're empowering them. You can make a gigantic emotion thermometer in the classroom so that everyone can practice during the day. We can talk about maybe a time that people felt that way and how they got back down to the blue. So lots of opportunities to teach this. We can start circle time each day by taking those three mindful breaths to help children practice taking those, those deep breaths to get relaxed. Um, and so I wanted to show you this uh, great video. So this comes from a classroom that was piloting an emotional curriculum called The Incredible Years. And they have been working a long time on this emotional thermometer type of strategy. And this teacher has this great moment that happens. It's unplanned, but it happened to be that they were videotaping in the classroom at that moment. So this amazing teacher actually sees this opportunity when this one little boy gets disappointed. Now, disappointed happens to be this little boy's red area. That's when his body will start to feel tense and start to feel stressed. So she takes, she sees this moment where she gives the child a sticker. This one little boy feels disappointed, and I want you to watch what happens next. Congratulations. Keep up the good work. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's go. You what? Oh, really? Hurt your feelings? You're feeling a little disappointed? Oh, that's a problem. Oh, he's taking a deep breath. Look at Louise. Simran is taking a deep breath because he said he was feeling a little disappointed. That's a great solution. All right. Feeling better? That's great. I'm glad. All right. Ooh, and there's a friend. A friend comes to your rescue. That's great. I love that video. I can say so many great things that are happening there. One of the things that I really love is that she doesn't just give him a sticker. She actually uses that moment to help him practice the skill of calming down. He's not quite ready to identify that emotion. You see it, he says, it hurts my feelings. And she says, oh, are you feeling a little disappointed? Because they've talked about disappointment being that red area for him. As soon as she says disappointment, he says yes, and then he recognizes what he can do, which is taking those deep breaths. And then, of course, I love that a friend comes to his rescue. A friend comes to help him out there. And um, clearly, this teacher has built up this idea that to be a good friend, you're helping a friend, helping a friend stay calm, helping a friend get calm, congratulating them when they do. Um, so just a lovely, lovely example of what it can be like when you build emotional vocabulary and you also teach some key skills to regulate those emotions, such as taking deep breaths. So, what is the definition of emotional regulation? So emotional regulation is referred, is defined as being able to manage uncomfortable feelings and coming back down 
to those calm states, being able to calm down, to being able to get back to the calming state. And what is one way to help children learn emotional regulation? And one way to help them learn is by introducing new words like tense and stressed, and by introducing also another word that's opposite of that, like calm and relaxed. And the teacher even used pasta, like the state of thin pasta, as being stressed and like stuck your body feeling bad and also the uh, boiled pasta for relaxed and calm and what is one way to teach children how to get back to the calm level of the emotional thermometer and that is done through mindful breathing in the video we watched she showed you how to use smelling the flowers and blowing out the candles as a way to teach children how to get from the uh, stressed an intense level to the calm state. So using mindful breathing. And it doesn't have three, it doesn't have to be three, but they can use breathing in and breathing out techniques. Emotional regulation. Teach children how to calm down. Three deep breaths, blow out the candles. So it doesn't have to be three, but you could teach them how to breathe in and breathe out using smell the flowers. And blow out the candles. And while you're doing that, make sure you verbalize what's going on. Tell them like you can feel the air going through your lungs and your nose and going all the way. And you blow out the candle like you're blowing a candle standing, sitting by your leg. So use mindful breathing. It doesn't have to be three. Relaxation thermometer. So when you have the thermometer, it's color coded and you could have different words to describe each of the color. So from the tense to the relaxed state, you take three deep breaths three or more deep breaths as you want, and out, use the uh, smell the flowers and blow out the candles. You get them from the red and ask them to define what they feel when they're are they tense or stressed or like the boy was. He was feeling uh, disappointed that he didn't get the sticker. To get them to calm down to the blue, which could be chill out or cool down uh, state. And you can make the thermometer yourself. Or you could use, these are examples of other uh, calming strategies, ways of uh, helping children calm down for mindful meditation is for all three, they have mindful meditation and uh, mindful breathing in them. So you're helping the children breathe in and breathe out and you're helping them to regulate, to get back to that calm state. If it was inside a classroom, you could have a relaxation or quiet space where they can just sit and relax and calm their body down. But we are virtual. So. Calming techniques. Now we're going to watch a video. And in this video, I want you to think about how the teacher shows calming techniques. And based on what you observe, how you will be able to teach these techniques in your classrooms. Alyssa, one more time. Breathe in through your nose. Fill up your lungs, look up, and blow it out slowly. All right, good job. Keep your legs crossed. Stretch way up high to the ceiling. Let's make two big circles, Haley. Slow. All these activities is to slow down our neurons, to slow down our brains. Stop at the top and go all the way to the right. Samaya, thank you for listening to me. Okay, there you go. Now we're going to zigzag it to the right, to the left, slow. Okay. How does this teacher show calming techniques? So the children, the teacher is not just saying, but she's also showing them. She's saying, take a deep breath and move your arm all the way up. And while she's saying it, she is also doing it. So she is modeling for them what to do. And she is also reinforcing the children who are doing it and she's thanking them for participating. So she's acknowledging the children who are participating and reminding them to take deep breath and going step by step describing what they're uh, doing. Based on what you observe, how will you teach the calming technique? So think about how you will teach calming techniques just like she did. Verbalize, tell them step by step what they need to do. Model with your own body and acknowledge the children who are participating. But also think about more ways that you can do to, to teach them common techniques. We're gonna watch another video, and in this video, I want you guys to watch how the teacher introduces the break chair and how the children respond. You might feel very angry, 
or frustrated, and he might need to take a break. So he's going to show you guys how he takes a break. So when he takes a break and he's frustrated and he's pounding his feet on the ground and his fists are clenched and he's stiff like the popsicle stick and he might be able to break, he knows that it's time for him to take a break. So he's going to walk over to the egg, egg chair. Zoop. And this egg chair is in the book area usually. So he's going to come and he's going to take a break. And while he's taking a break, he is going to find the break box. See? And in this break box, he can choose to play with pigs or he can choose to play with a puzzle or he can choose to color. And so today he's going to choose to color. So when Freddie takes a break, he can choose one of these things to do out of the break box to help him get calm. So I am looking for, for a volunteer to come help and show our friends how to take a break. I'm looking for a friend who's sitting crisscross, quiet hand. A guy, come on up. So that comes up here. So, okay. So, Guy, when should we take? When might you need to take a break? When I stomp my feet. When he stomps his feet. When he feels like he is in the red. So he might need to take a break. Okay. So how does the teacher introduce the break chair? She uses a puppet, and she expresses body different body language and face expressions on the puppet to show them what emotional state, red, and red emotional state that you need to be to take the a break and use the break chair. So she uses a puppet and the body language. She also goes by step by step on what they need to do, the emotional state that they need to be in, how to sit on the chair and while on the chair, how to use the break, the break box. So she goes step by step on what they need to do to use that. But another thing, she also uses a one of her students as a model. So she brings a guy to her and she asks him, what do you think you need to feel to use that? So she's using also a child to model how to use it. And how do the children respond? If you observe them, the children observed by, uh, responded by listening. All of them were very attentive and all the, she had all their attention and they were even sitting very like face forward and their eyes on the teacher and on the puppet and the guy. So they were observing what she was doing and all the things she was saying, they were just taking it in. And that is how she introduced the break chair. So in this video, from the beginning to now, we talked about defining emotional literacy, how to expand young children's emotional vocabulary, how to move away from just using simple emotional words like happy, sad, and mad, how to use visual visuals to help children learn new feeling words, define emotion, emotional regulation and how to use the emotional thermometer and other tools to help children regulate their emotions. So that was our video for today. Now for this section, you are going to be having a reading assignment where you're going to read an article. And you're going to analyze the article about helping young children and you're going to reflect and apply what you learned from the article on uh, your learning and your activities with children. This information about the assignment will be on, posted on iLearn, so you don't have to worry about that. It will be posted on iLearn. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.